Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke, ready with an answer. This is part four uh, on the study of Roman Catholicism. And I will be referring to it simply as Romanism throughout. So when I say Romanism, I'm speaking of the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, if you did not see the first three parts of this study, uh, they are available on my YouTube channel. Uh, it would be very helpful if you went back and watched it from the beginning. In part one, um, I tried to determine if uh, Roman Catholicism should be just accepted as a part of Christianity or does Roman Catholicism have enough serious problems that we cannot even call it Christianity? And we decided, no, it is, it is not uh, part of Christianity at all. In fact, we concluded that uh, it is in a, a Christian cult. When I say Christian cult, I mean it's something that is uh, represented as being Christian, but in fact is seriously flawed and, and uh, it, so that it could not be considered Christianity at all. Uh, what, what I always refer to as a biblical Christianity, Christianity as we get it from the Bible. Uh, and, and then we looked at uh, the uh, origins of Romanism and uh, determined that uh, no, it, they do not have papal succession uh, going to the apostle Peter, as they claim. Uh, really, it didn't start until the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. Um, and and the, the, the origins of it were are just completely mixed with Roman paganism. And that's what you still have today. It's, it's not biblical Christianity. It's simply Roman paganism mixed with a little bit of Christian ideas and, and the name of Jesus. Uh, and then uh, last week, uh, I began talking about the, the, the atrocities of, of the uh, Roman Catholic religion throughout history uh, and the, the book Fox's Book of Martyrs. I highly recommend everyone read that book and you'll get great details on uh, the atrocities of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the things that they did in terms of torturing people who did not agree with their religion uh, is it's it's mind-boggling and heartbreaking to, to think that even can people could conceive of such horrible tortures. And then I I began discussing the uh, the popes directly the personal conduct of the popes, and that's where we are today. And I see that Brother Jackson. Uh, Mecha Wing Zero has joined me. Uh, hi, brother. Hi. Yeah, well, I'm glad you could participate, and uh, mm -hmm. maybe there will be more people joining us, maybe not, but uh, I mm -hmm. just gave kind of a um, recap of what's been discussed up to this point, uh, and now we're at the point where we're beginning to discuss the actual personal conduct and character of individual popes throughout history. <clears throat> and we just started that uh, last session. So uh, first, uh, let me ask you to, if anybody's watching and they're not familiar with your channel, uh, just introduce yourself and tell everybody about what Mecha Wing Zero is about. All right. Um, my name is Jackson. Um, I have two channels. I have Mecha Wing Zero, my main channel. And I have a side channel for dealing with the errors of Calvinism called the Osas Arminian. And um, I, 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 um, I, I, feel, I consider myself more of a student of the Bible than I am a teacher of the Bible. And I just really enjoy studying these issues and contending for the great gospel message. All right. Well, you're, uh, you're quite humble the way you express that and uh, I, I do have to want everybody to know that uh, you, you not only are a student but you're a very learned student you're very knowledgeable thank and so you thank you, you. Have, you have an awful lot of uh, knowledge to contribute to any of these conversations 
And uh, I think that uh, everybody, if, we, if we're going to be honest, though, we would, we would classify ourselves, as, as you just did, students of the Bible. Because I, I personally uh, cannot explain every verse in the Bible. How about you, brother? You think you got every verse in the Bible down just so that you, you have a perfect explanation and understanding? Yeah, absolutely not. But part of the um, part of my student teacher distinction is that I don't feel like I'm any more of a teacher than any other Christian who's studying the Bible, who shares their thoughts with other people. Because mm -hmm. other people, you know, it says in, in, in James, let not many of you become teachers, have authority over others in the church and everything like that. So that's why I said that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, your, your humility is something that is, uh, you know, part of, I think, of... of being a mature Christian, and uh, unfortunately, it's sorely lacking among many of the brethren that I've met, <laughs> that kind of humility. So, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm coughing throughout because uh, I still have the remnant of a sore throat. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go um, directly now into the, the subject matter we're talking about popes. There are there are many popes throughout history who have uh, been uh, absolutely some of the most um, sinful, uh, worst e examples of humanity with their personal conduct. And we're only going to be discussing a few of them, but uh, there's many more that we could cite. I'm moving to now Pope Leo the Tenth and his. Uh, uh, his papal papal reign, or whatever I, I would call that, is was from, uh, well, maybe this is his lifespan, 1475 to 1521. Um, it says, often associated with Martin Luther and the upheavals of the Protestant Reformation, Pope Leo X is also well known for being one of the most lavish, uncontrollable spenders who ever headed the Christian Church. A famous phrase attributed to Leo aptly illustrates his greatest priority. Quote, since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it, unquote. <laughs> According to Alexandre Dumas, quote, Christianity assumed a pagan character, unquote, as Leo doggedly pursued worldly pleasures. Well, Wait, so let one me question, Luke. Did you, yes. well, you said You said that since God has given us something, let us enjoy it. Or you said that Leo said that or something. What, since yeah, God has given us what, did you say? Yeah, it, uh, I was uh, quoting uh, this Pope Leo X. He mm -hmm. said, quote, since God has given us the papacy. The papacy, okay. That's just a, a way of a saying that he has the t holds the position of Pope. I uh, see, I see. He says, that let sounds us like a jack smack word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If he was here, he'd probably have a lot more uh, words to add that we would have to look up in the dictionary. <laughs> yeah, I recently learned the word pusillanimous from him. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a funny sounding word. <laughs> it means cowardly for the audience or whatever. Oh, okay. That's a it means that's cowardly. A lot. But 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 I I love I love. You know, one of the best, if anyone out there needs to study for the SAT, listen to Jack Smack's sermons a lot. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's just another good reason to listen to Brother Jack Smack. Um, so I want to ask you, um, there's more to be said about this Leo the Tenth, but just what I said so far, I'd like to get your reaction to, let me repeat the main point here. Uh, it's that... Uh, uh, he says, since he's been given this papacy, he, we sh he should enjoy it. And uh, then another uh, critic qu quoted, Christianity assumed a pagan character as Leo Dogley pursued worldly pleasures. Now, what do you think of just the basic idea of uh, someone who uh, uh, assumes such a powerful position and decides to uh, approach it in that manner? Well, I think almost anyone would agree that that's unethical. But what what I want to um, say here is, what he said said um, 
he, he might as well enjoy his position, I'm paraphrasing. Um, it seems to me like that's that's sort of the picture of exploitation, if, if that makes sense, you know. A picture of, a picture of what? Of exploitation. Oh, yes. Yeah, because here's the thing. Whether whether it's God given or or whether there was no God or whatever, it seems like like the the picture of exploiting others using your position is encapsulated in his quote that you shared with us. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see that uh, this is a uh, uh, Pope Leo the Tenth is uh, this is a. Uh, a description of him, but this description could be applied uh, almost universally among all the popes because that's the attitude they had with this powerful position that they they, they held. Let me uh, walk, welcome uh, Brother Bill Cuthbert and ask him to uh, say hi, and then uh, I'll ask him to begin commenting on this. Uh, brother, hi. Hello, hello. Yeah, I've got it. I'm in. I've only just managed to get the link. There was a delay on Skype that's been playing up, so. It's all all right now. Well, brother, you, you didn't uh, you didn't miss much. I just did a kind of a recap, a brief recap of what we've covered in the previous episodes, and now we're continuing talking about some of these popes. And this Pope Leo the Tenth, he took the attitude that since he was uh, given this powerful position, that he might as well just enjoy it. So he developed a very pagan, lavish lifestyle. Uh, what what is your reaction to that? Well, that sounds about right. I'm not sure if it's the same pope that, that I had in mind, but I know that, that one of the popes uh, for a celebration had a massive cake built for him, and inside the cake were, were loads and loads of little naked boys. <laughs> uh, it could be, and that's the truth, that could be Leo. I'm not 100% sure on that, so I'll, I'll double-check. You know, that 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 is actually a fact. So yeah, that is certainly certainly lavish and, and certainly filthy. Yeah. Well, <coughs> um, that doesn't surprise me. Now, what you just said, <coughs> I'm not sure that there are, are will be some viewers, uh, and Catholics, and they're viewing this. Uh, they they will be shocked and appalled and and uh, angry that that we could even make such a claim, but. It, but it's pretty easy to find these things if you just research the history of the, the, the Roman Catholic religion and the popes. Uh, it, it's out there for anybody to discover that that, that example you gave is, is not uh, um, something that surprises me at all. Yeah, I'm, um, I want to confirm that. Sorry, look, just, that, was, that was Pope Leo X. Uh, yes, we're talking about Pope Leo X right now. Yeah, and that was the one that has the... Oh wow, it was. Huh? Well, let me let me read. Um, I have a little bit more here, real quick, though. Quick. Okay. You All see, right, go ahead. Okay. You see, here's here's another thing. So far, we've just talked about the basic concept of exploiting an office being unethical, but it would be good to read the Apostle Paul's qualifications to be an elder real quickly. So that we know, so that everyone knows, we're not just saying these these things as as our opinions or whatever. But it says right here that this is a faithful saying: if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must then be then must excuse me be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest, be, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 
So that's what the Apostle Paul says about the qualifications to lead in the church. I'll let the audience decide for themselves whether his quote embodies that or not. Well, I'm I'm really glad that you um, uh, felt that you, we we should uh, quote to it that scripture. There's a that if we were to actually just break that scripture down word for word and verse for verse. We could probably spend a two-hour discussion just on that alone, but uh, even at one reading, uh, anybody who's listening with objectively can could see that uh, there's there's a certain standard of character and behavior and spiritual maturity that is expected to hold these um, positions in the church, where you are, um, you know, pastors and bishops and and elders, and and uh, let's let's examine. To see if these popes uh, uh, have met this standard. So thank you for for add, adding that. Maybe you could, if you could paste that in here. I'd like to have that to refer sure, to I'll again. Paste it I'll ask Brother Bill to comment to your 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 scripture. Well, yeah, these these are the only deal things that they, if you want to have a, a, a you know the role of an elder or a bishop, you know, within a church, you know, and, and that's, that's where we're talking about Catholicism. And particularly Pope Leo the Tenth, you know, we can see that he's he's fell short on every single one of them, you know, requirements, and then obviously added these perversities on top of them. Yeah, you know, a thought comes to my mind. That, <clears throat> uh, I, I know Brother Jackson has has uh, talked to me quite a bit about this uh, privately, and. Uh, and I've made some videos on this subject, and that is the uh, the charge against us, those of us who are <clears throat> biblical Christians, who know that salvation is not based upon our personal behavior, our conduct, our performance. It's based upon the performance and of Jesus Christ, what He did for us, and our faith in Him and His work. And so, um, those of us who believe this biblical Christianity sometimes are accused of uh, giving people a quote license to sin, uh, but we don't feel that way at all. We we still feel that uh, once a person has uh, received the gift of eternal life and salvation by faith in, alone in Christ alone, then uh, then we trust that the Holy Spirit will work in their life and transform them, and and uh, they will grow. Everybody will grow to a certain different levels. Not everybody matures to the same level. Not everybody matures as quickly. But we trust Jesus to do the saving. We trust the Holy Spirit living inside the believer to do the transforming. Uh, so we're not endorsing just go out and sin all you want. But it seems to me, that's what I'm seeing in the Roman Catholic Church, because uh, you know all you got to do is just every week just go in that uh, confessional and confess, and they'll forgive all your sins. So now go out and sin all you want this week, and, and we'll come forgive them again next week. And it seemed like this pope has the that attitude too that uh, he somehow has a license to sin. Uh, Brother Jackson, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I'd say that that pope. Uh, let's be as fair as possible. And we're talking about this pope specifically. Does think at least that he has a license to sin for himself, at least. I, I doubt he'd be interested and apply that to other people. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you you know you're you're always uh, you always want to pull the reins back on me and and uh, anybody who is making a, cl a claim that may not uh, be a uh, hundred percent foolproof. So um, you're kind of like the the, the scripture cop, you know? <laughs> and that's good. That's good because I we no we don't want to apply this universally to every Roman Catholic, and we don't want to apply it universally to every single pope. But um, the popes um, as a group have a long history of this bad kind of behavior, and they're certainly not ex ex the kinds of examples that we see in the scripture that you put up as far as describing what our leaders are supposed to be. Right. Uh, before I go on, Brother Bill, uh, would you want to comment on this license to sin and uh, a question, and then I'll, I'll read more about Leo. Well, the, the way I see, you know, license to sin is that 
you know, sin itself doesn't need a license. You know, we're all <laughs> we're all sinners in all forms, short, I suppose, in that regard. But it seems almost perverse that that, that from a from a cult, as we like to call the Roman the Roman Church, you know, they base their you know salvation message on works, works, and good behaviour, whereas we don't. Yet they're the ones that want to use grace, grace, grace to do whatever they please. You know, it seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no comment on uh, the use of the confessional as a license to sin from either of you? Well, I, I, I suppose the closest I can get is, is a, a verse that, that, that the Pope said, you know, and their, and their bishops like to abuse, is in John mm -hmm. twenty twenty three, And that says, you know, who, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And, and that verse that we use to, to, you know, show that they have apostolic power to, to forgive sins or absolve sins. Now, in the case of uh, Pope Leo, you know, he assumed that verse applied nicely to him because he could absolve his own sins. You know, it is a really misused uh, verse and taken out of complete context. And that is one I know they use for sure. Yeah, let me say this about the confessional booth. It's hard to it's hard to to say exactly how people use it because everyone is different. I'm sure there are some Roman Catholics out there um who 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 try very strongly to to repent or to actually change their behavior after confessing or whatever. But the the the, the truth is many do use it as a quote-unquote license to sin, because the the thing is like like I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Don John or anyone in the audience has seen this movie, but it's about a um a guy who's a Roman Catholic in the movie who's obsessed with pornography, and every week he just confesses to the 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 priest what he does with absolutely zero intention to change or whatever, but but the the thing is this though. It's kind of interesting. I heard on um th there there's a there's a false teacher out there whose name is Don Johnson. I'm not talking about some YouTube user. I'm talking about somebody who's well known and has podcasts and everything. And he was um he taught lordship salvation. He was against what he called easy believism and everything. And just out of curiosity, about a week or two ago, I went to his website just to see, just, 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 I guess, out of morbid curiosity. And it turns out he became a Roman Catholic, and that's what. And he's joining the Roman Catholic Church now, even though he used to be like a lordship Protestant kind of thing. Because I, I what, and I heard his podcast about why he's changing to become a Catholic and everything. And I think this this work system appeals to two people that seems contradictory to me. And here's the two peop two or two groups of people, excuse me. One group of people who wants to try as best they can to be good and get to have salvation. And then the other group of people, people who really don't want to embrace the, the grace of Christ, but they still want some kind of license, quote unquote, to sin, so they can confess and get forgiven, and then confess and get forgiven, and then confess and get forgiven without really any any um without really seeing their need of a savior. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I do think it makes sense. Uh, uh, but it also made me wonder, um, do, do some Roman Catholics use this confessional as a license to sin? That's one question. But uh, another question is, how about the non-Roman Catholics who use 1 John 1.9 in a similar manner, uh, uh, obviously, I believe First John one nine is this talking about if we confess our sins, our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That just that's talking to the unbeliever, letting them know if you confess you are a sinner and you need to, to Jesus to cleanse you and, and, and be your savior. It's not talking about someone continually confessing their sin. I mean, some people use First John one nine like, 
like you know every, every 30 minutes or so they're they're going they're going to first John 1 9 and uh, but do you think that possibly some of the biblical Christians who agree with us on these basic things and yet they use first John 1 9 in that way brother Bill yeah yeah I'd probably agree with that yeah and I'm also in the same uh, you know mind as you that, that you know if you read you know first John 1 you know the first portion of that chapter is to the believer and then the second portion is to the non-believer so this you know verses 8 9 and 10 are speaking to you know the unbeliever you know to be to confess you know to be saved you know and that, that's an important point that, that that even now many christians don't quite grasp they think it's to the believer so it's a, it's like a continuation as you just say in out, in out, in out. Keep confessing and, and stuff. Where it's actually speaking to the unbeliever. You know, they need to correct, confess Christ. You know, and they need to, you know, get sins forgiven once for all. You know, by the blood of Christ. Yeah, the, the, these are really the two foundational verses for Roman Catholicism's doctrine of the confessional booth. Uh, the First John one nine and the one you quoted earlier. Uh, about he has the power for to remit sins. Uh, I think he was talking to uh, the apostles. But in getting back to that verse, I think that he was talking to the apostles and maybe disciples. Maybe it was a larger group that were there. I don't know how many were listening, but he was talking to them all as believers. Every believer has the power for of remission of sin because we have the power to tell people the gospel. By telling them the gospel, that's the power that we we have. And if let we me cannot, let, let me yeah. say something about your First John one nine um, observation. What, regardless of which point of view you take on First John one nine, I feel this is very 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 different than the Roman Catholics or people who use First John one nine every thirty minutes or whatever, because those Christians go directly to God. They, they believe in the universal priesthood of the believer. They don't go to a confessional booth. And the other thing about confession is confession, um, I, I, I thought, denotes some desire to change or to, to improve at least in that, in that way. I, don't, I really don't think it's fair to compare people like, like our sister Brain Audi, for example, to Roman Catholics in that way. Yeah. Well, that's that's a very good uh, legitimate point you made. Uh, um, as far as uh, that they are they're directly appealing to God instead of a priest as a inter intercessor between them and, and God. Uh, but but I do think that uh, that it's an error to think that a, a believer has to continually go and confess their sins over and over again uh, to they don't say really have their sins forgiven they believe their sins are forgiven but but to to regain a fellowship like they get out of fellowship with God God turns their back on them doesn't listen to their prayers and and kind of shuns them until they exercise first John 1 9 I think that's a misapplication of it but the main thing about first John 1 9 and the verse that uh, Bill quoted I don't know if he posted it but wherever that is Bill if you have the verse number of that talking yes. about to the apostles about having the power to, to remit sins. Those are the two foundational verses that I think that Romanism does uh, use for their confessional. So, do you think yes. that's, that's uh, you see how they misuse those verses? Well, yeah, I, I can. The first I did, that was John 20, 23. And that, that, is the, that is the main one that they use. And they also use, uh, I can't recall off mine where it is, you know, whatever. You know, should be bound on earth, should be bound in heaven. You know, they, they, they like the loosen and the binding as well as if they have, you know, that apostolic, because they believe in apostolic taxation. So, you know, according to them, you know, the Pope is not only Christ on earth, the vicar of Christ, you know, vicar of Christ, that is also a descendant of, of, of Peter. So mm -hmm. apostolic taxation is what they believe in. So that is why they, they, they use that verse in this quote. Mm-hmm. You know, later, I don't want to get us off topic right now, but later, Bill, I would love to talk to you about First John and why you think the first part is written to unbelievers and then it switches over to believers because um, 
I've never really heard of that interpretation from a grace believer, and I know you're a hardcore grace believer, and I would love to have an interesting discussion about First John and get your thoughts on that sometime later. It sounds good to me. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, that's that's just one of the things I love about Jackson. You know, he gets so uh, he wants to <laughs> he wants to investigate something. Hey, brother Sam's here, but uh, brother Jackson is. Uh, you know, he's uh, if if there's something that is off a little bit in his his mind, he doesn't just ignore it and just say, okay, let's. I want. I don't need a, an answer on that. He wants to dig and investigate and try to try to resolve it. So that's a great attitude to have. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, I, and let me also just make make it clear. Like if Bill, in this conversation we're going to have later, can prove to me or or provide good arguments that the, of what he's saying is true with the first John being written to um, the first part of first John being written to unbelievers, I I definitely embrace that position. I'm just curious what his evidence is. So. Okay, now let me just welcome Brother Sam uh, Thick Shades uh, to our conversation. Uh, Sam, have, have you um, heard anything up to this point, or are, should I give you like a little refresher so you know what we're talking about? Oh, hi guys. I, I'm just um, joining in from my from my cell. I don't know if you can hear me okay. I cannot uh, check the chat area right now, so I, but I can hear you guys. Uh, but I haven't heard uh, the Hangout yet, um, just joining in, so uh, that would be great uh, if you can sum it up. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you, as far as your uh, audio goes, it, to me, I, it's, it's very clear. Uh, how about you other guys? Can, can you hear Sam uh, very clearly? Yeah, I can hear Sam clearly. Okay, yes. so no, no problem with your audio, Sam. And uh, I won't recap everything. I just kind of uh, gave a brief recap of what we've covered in the last few weeks on Roman Romanism, and now we're we're talking about individual popes, their their behavior, and where we've been talking about Pope Leo the Tenth, and the fact that he uh, he he was celebrating the fact that well, since I've got this powerful position, I'm going to take advantage of it and really enjoy it, and he became very lavish. And very uh, p pagan and, and uh, abused abused his position. So, uh, uh, if you have any reaction to that, uh, say something, and then otherwise, I'm going to go on and read a little bit more about him. No, I don't have a reaction yet. Uh, sounds very interesting. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you're ever going to go into uh, this. Is a little different, uh, you know me. But uh, I don't know if you're going to get into any subject matter where what sort of uh, you know, other cults, other religions uh, came about from Roman Catholicism. Uh, we know, like for example, uh, Islam came about, came out of Catholic. So uh, maybe in the future, uh, maybe uh, we can cover that as well. But I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So at some point, uh, this is uh, this, this is going to be. We, this is our fourth show. And I expect that we're going to have many more, and uh, that that will be something to be discussed at some point in time too. So let me continue talking about uh, this uh, Pope Leo the Tenth, and um, uh, let me see. Oh. Sorry, my cursor, my. Is not scrolling very smoothly. It's jumping. Uh, give a second. Uh, okay, so Leo doggedly pursued worldly pleasures. Uh, in addition to living a life of splendor, Leo practiced nepotism. Famously, used the sale of indulgences to finance the reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica and was even accused of homosexuality. In fact, some sources hold that he died in bed while getting it on with a youth. The, that accusation may or may not be true, of course, but one thing is for sure, Leo certainly let his love of luxury get the best of him. Um, let's, let me 
ask uh, Brother Sam to react first to that since he hasn't had a chance to talk yet. Well, um, what would you like me to talk about? <laughs> The, the, the reaction to what I just read about uh, this uh, Pope Leo X and his uh, um, uh, lavish, well, you know, lavish right, lifestyle, right. sexuality, and pedophilia. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't want to, like, you know, rag on dad guys or anything like that. But, uh, I mean, we all know about these guys, you know, a bunch of pedophiles and hypocrites. Um, you know, they they suck the blood of the uh, the peasants, for, for example. And they chop off anyone's hand who would be reading the Bible or put them in the dungeon or whatever while they're drinking and dining and whining and all that. Um, you know, uh, while people are suffering, you know, they're drinking people's blood, uh, eating their flesh. Uh, no wonder they are called the uh, you know the whore, the beast. I mean, the things they do are such an abomination. It's just beyond uh, any description, you know. So, and for them to you know claim themselves to be holy, and <laughs> for people even would call them holy fathers, it's just I don't know. I, it's just like. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, talking in the uh, dead air. But uh, you know, whenever I think about that, I I cannot fathom uh, the fact that I mean, how can even people once you know kind of consider what they are doing is kind of against even what's well, written in the scripture? I mean, it's, I mean, now people don't get killed for reading the Bible. Now you don't get persecuted. Now you don't get put in jail or prison for copying or translating uh, the, the Bible. So, I mean, you don't have any excuse. I mean, it, obviously, what they're doing is so unbiblical. I mean, those people, and that's one of the reasons why I say about these heretics, whether that's, whether there would be a Calvinism or Arminianism or a Catholicism, you know, if they're truly born again, and if they're really born, uh, are saved, they're not going to be staying that sort of cultic environment for a long time, you know. But if I see these sort of popes immersed in, within the environment, you know, they were never born again. They were just indoctrinated with, since when they were kids. And uh, how can they be a son of God? How, how can they be sons of God when they can't even, when they're not even born again? So, uh, you know, obviously that sort of thing reflects their behavior, you know. Sorry, I'm, I, I, I've gotten a little longer and a little like a ramble, but it's my basic complaint against them. Uh, it's easy to uh, actually get appalled and, and, and sickened when we learn about the behavior of it's 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 a, there's a, is a difference between a lay person where we don't expect as much uh, as we would from our leaders. And we were talking about the scriptures that talks about what is expected from elders and bishops, and and uh, there's a standard of behavior that is expected. And this person that's called the pope, um, he. The, the standard that we should expect from him should be the highest of all uh, if he was truly a, a leader of Christianity and yet we see this horrible kind of behavior. I would like to ask uh, Jackson and Bill to respond to that statement I made about the indulgences to raise the money. What, what We're going to talk more about that but since this is the first time the word indulgence is brought up, uh, Brother Jackson, oh, could you tell us what an indulgence is and, and how the Romanism used used indulgences. Well, I believe indulgence is anything that you take to um, basically you just take it to its full potential. You know, if you indulge in food, you eat until you can't eat anymore. 
if you indulge in spending, you spend until you can't spend anymore. But the thing is, um, uh, re repeat the first part of the question just so I can answer in the most accurate way possible besides the indulging. Okay, uh, now you went to the root word indulge, and, we, and you're correct, but the, the, the term indulgence as the Romanism used it, uh, do you know? Do you know how what the indulgences actually were, and how they were used to raise money? I'm, af uh, I'm afraid I don't. Okay, I know I'm going to ask Brother Bill to go expound on that because I'm sure he's, he's very familiar with it. Brother Bill. Well, yeah, yeah. The the the, the, the nepotism is basically favoritism, you know, and, and the indulgences by favor with with the the the, the vicar of Christ, the, the Pope. And you know what comes to mind straight away is James chapter two, the first you know few verses, where where James is actually pointing out that, that this such favoritism is forbidden. It, it really goes against the real law of love, and, and it, you know it is in essence the love of money and buying favors from 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 the Pope. You know it's an abominable thing. You know and and you know the, in essence, the more money you have. You know, under Catholicism, because that hasn't changed, because they've reintroduced indulgences in this country under the Roman Church. Is the more money you have, the more favour you have, and the more chance of being given, you know, forgiveness for sins or sins being absolved, you know, or getting flippant Aunt Betty, you know, out of purgatory. You know, it's perverse, and and unfortunately, it is making a comeback in England. And that's and that is just in regard to you know, nepotism. You know, I was going to go on, on uh, you know, the, the, the extra ecclesian Narsalus, which is, you know, where they say outside of the Roman Church, there is no salvation. So, you know, if people have that in mind and, and they believe that, you know, they, they feel inclined to give indulgences because they want to buy favour with the Pope, they want to get to heaven, thus they give indulgences. It's all linked and it's all perverse. Okay. Uh, I, you also commented on nepotism, which just means that you are um, giving a favor to a family member over some over the someone else. Uh, you're strictly because they're part of your your children or related to you. That's nepotism. So uh, that's that's unfair. And, and nepotism today, sometimes you see that, and people can see that that's. Uh, uh, unfair way to judge someone's uh, achievements. You 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 should base their promotions on on what they've done rather than you know just the fact that they're your ch your child or your grandchild. So he practiced nepotism, favoring his family members, trying to try, try to get his family members to follow and be pope the pope too. But then this idea of an indulgence. I don't think anybody has, has explained it the way that I understand an indulgence by the Romanism. <clears throat> Let's say that Brother Bill was a, a, a Roman monk in a, coming to our town, and uh, he was there to raise money by selling indulgences. And he came up to me and said, uh, you know, you've... Uh, uh, it, the, the, this indulgence is, you know, five hundred dollars, or or you can get one for a thousand dollars, and uh, that that means that you're the the fact that you're uh, uh, committing adultery and uh, you're or or whatever your sin is, then this we will indulge it, and for this amount of money you, you you'll be forgiven. Otherwise, uh, you'll end up going to purgatory and having to pay it off in purgatory and suffer there. So they use purgatory as a threat. To people, uh, to uh, so that people would have to pay these indulgences rather than purgatory, uh, and then they they would say, okay, uh, not only should you buy this indulgence because of what you've done, but buy another one now in advance for for what you're going to do next, whatever. You, so um, we're talking about the license to sin, and that that's what the indulgence actually was. It was a literal license to sin in writing. And for a fee. Okay, so Brother Jackson, now that you know what an indulgence is, I'd like to get your reaction to that. 
Yeah, I have heard of that, Luke. I've never heard the word indulgence attached to that. I always heard it as like a ransom payment or something like that. But that's um, it, it, it's kind of ironic that Catholics accuse grace believers of promoting a license to sin, when at least in their church history, I doubt they do that anymore anywhere, but at least in their church history, they offered a totally literal license to sin, not just metaphorical. Okay. Um, Brother Sam, do you want to say something about indulgences before I move on? No, no but uh, I do like to say about purgatory. Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, can you guys believe anyone from Catholic denomination or Catholic studies or doctrines? Anybody who is in Roman, Roman Catholic, if they kind of pick up the scripture, they can notice that you know that purgatory is not in the scripture anywhere. Only, only in the doctrines where they have written up. You know, Christ never talked about purgatory. So, you know, I think I, I, I'm kind of glad that they divided themselves as Catholic, but I, I'm not really happy about them borrowing, you know, the word Catholic because you know what it, as it means is as a whole, as a one. And it, it seems like as if Satan has chosen that war, war intentionally <laughs> so that we can get confused later on. But, and also ushering the, uh, the one world uh, religion and so forth. Uh, but, you know, as far as that sort of war, purgatory is concerned, I mean, how can they not find that sort of discre uh, discrepancy, you know? I mean, they can see hell. All right, as far as we go, Hades. All right, okay, well, you know, beyond whatever Hades or hell or even uh, shore, <laughs> another word that they like to uh, replace instead of using the word hell, you know, um, all these kind of devices they have made, when you really come to think about it, including baby baptism, I think it's about putting fear into people's mind, putting burden into their hearts, and to do what? To make more money. And I think that's where the whole cause is. And from the beginning, uh, where how they started even. So that sort of uh, filthy uh, look or sake, I think that's one of the reasons why we have even a doctrine like you know, purgatory or even like baby baptism and other idiotic, uh, you know, the rest of Catholic doctrines that is besides, so much besides what Christ said and done for us. Okay. Uh, I'd like to, before we move on, uh, uh, talk to more about what Jackson said, he, that he doesn't believe that these indulgences uh, are practiced today by uh, the Roman Catholic religion. Well, it is a historical fact that no one can dispute that the you right. actually what I to be clear, written. Luke, what I said was what what I said was that I doubt that they issue these written ransom note type of things that specifically allow somebody to do something. I'm, as far as just indulging in general, the way you're saying, I don't I, I haven't made a comment on that. I th I think there's been crosswise between indulgences and papal bulls, because uh, indulgences still go on, but I know papal bulls don't. Okay. Um, well, you'd ha you'd have to talk more about that, Bill, that, whether they're going on. I'm, uh, I, I'm not aware of them actually offering certificates for a fee, for, so they can they'll in, the church will indulge them in a, in a sin. But I do know this that uh, there are a lot of Roman Catholics that are pressured and I know someone in my family that uh, they've, they've been uh, giving a lot of money to the church and you know wanting to leave their inheritance to, to the Roman Catholic religion as a form of an indulgence in other words that that will give them the favor and in return for that then uh, they're going to get this reward of heaven or 
less time in purgatory. So it may not be a written certificate drill. If you know of that practice still going on, then you can expound on that. But in, even without their certificate, they're still kind of using people uh, in that way, saying for a, for a certain amount of money, if you'll donate it or leave it in your will to us, then we will guarantee you that this result. So, um, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, because I, 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 I obviously live in England, and, and the Roman Church is, has overtaken the Anglican community in England now. The, the, our, even our former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, paid indulgence when he saw, you know, the bones of St. Teresa, you know, to justify, you know, some of the things that, you know, the, the, the war in Iraq and stuff. To, to give them a pardon and all such things, you know that that's common knowledge and that's in that was in newspapers and you know and it, it, he's not kept that hidden, you know he's part of a, a, some secret uh, Roman Catholic orders, you know, so you know it's common knowledge in England that indulgences are still sold and people still venerate and pay money to see that the, the bones of you know these these saints. That's a fact. Very good. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll also say something about uh, the, this word Catholic that uh, our Brother Sam was pointing out that it's kind of hi hijacked. The word Catholic just simply means universal. Universal. Uh, so, and that the, in other words, uh, it's like it should be used interchangeably as with the term that we use called the body of Christ. The the total. Uh, collective, collective of all those who put their faith in Jesus for salvation is the body of believers or the body of Christ and, or uh, the, the Catholic Church which means it's, it's a totality of all the believers so that's the word Catholic but uh, they have used, take, taken that word and now I, we can't use it uh, because the world doesn't understand it I don't think it's the four of us are going to be able to change the way that people perceive that word. So I can't really uh, use the word Catholic the way it, it should be used uh, because it's really uh, tied so much to Romanism, to Roman Catholicism. Uh, so, uh, all right, let's go on unless someone wants to say a final remark on that. Okay. Um, now, I'm moving to Pope Clement the sixth. Um, his uh, life or reign, I'm not sure which this is, was from 12, um, oops, 1291 to 1352. And um, it's uh, Pierre Roger, a Frenchman was the fourth of the Avignon popes and took the name Clement the sixth for his pontificate. He was not particularly evil man, in fact his efforts during the Black Plague did much to provide refuge for the Jews who automatically became the scapegoats for the deadly breakout. Described as a fine gentleman, a prince and a patron of the arts and learning, Clement lacked one important characteristic that is rightly expected of popes and that is saintliness. By his own words, Clement was, quote, a sinner among sinners, unquote. His love for expensive living quickly drained the savings of his frugal predecessor, Benedict the Twelfth, and Clement resorted to raising taxes and selling off bishoprics to finance his worldly pursuits. Throw in a little nepotism to boot, and you've got yourself a pope who may very well have been a man of decent character, but who also used his powerful position for his own sexual adventures, cheerful pleasures, and overall celebration of the world's many vices. Uh, let, me, let me say again, before I ask you to respond to this, that uh, uh, the viewers may be wondering, why are we harping on this? Uh, and it's the same kind of reason I think that we wanted to tell everybody about the character of John Calvin, so people understood who this man really is. And do you do you want your name to be associated with John Calvin if you understand that he was actually an evil man and a heretic uh, and you were, could you call yourself a Calvinist? And it's the same thing. Do you want to be identified as a Roman Catholic and with these, all of these popes as your leaders 
who uh, so many of them had these horrible lives that were not really examples uh, that you'd like to see uh, as a leader of Christianity. So that's the reason I think it's important for a Roman Catholic who may be ignorant of these things for us to, to go through some of these popes so they can see the history of the bad behavior of their leaders. Okay, so let me ask Brother Jackson to comment first on, on this pope. Frankly, he sounds just like the last one to me. It's like, um, it's almost like in these days, being high up in the church could give you like like a, a Tony Stark style, l l lifestyle kind of thing. So it seems like that was a huge appeal for people. Um. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think uh, your statement that he sounds like the first, it's, so we have a pattern here. And there's a saying, uh, and this is not a bit out of the scriptures, but maybe we could think of something in the scripture that supports it, but that is that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when, when these people get this kind of a powerful position, uh, unfortunately, uh, that kind of power, uh, they take advantage of it, and uh, because they can have um, uh, orgies with women, or orgies with little boys, or or have the most uh, uh, expensive, you know, uh, uh, palaces and and, uh, and 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 just treasures around them all the time. Since they have the ability to do that, the the human nature, well, they, they succumb to it. And so does does absolute power like a pope had at that time. Though these popes really were basically more powerful than kings. Uh, does it co absolutely corrupt? Uh, Brother Brother Bill? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> as simple as that. Yeah, power, power corrupts, absolute power. And they did, as you say, rightly say, you know, coming from England and, and knowing the history of England and Europe, you know, to, to a certain degree, you know, they were kingmakers. You know, they had the power to, to, to really, in essence, to choose who the kings were and how laws were defined and all manner of things. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Brother Sam, do you want to make a comment on that before I move on to another pope? No, I'm good. I think, I think uh, we made all the legit points. Okay, let's talk about Pope uh, Urban II um, from uh, 1035 to 1099 AD. Uh, it's undeniable that Otho de Legere, who became Pope Urban II in 1088, was a talented diplomat and successful leader responsible for establishing the modern Roman Curia, and supporting reforms of the clergy. What he is most often remembered for, however, is his unfortunate role in launching a bloody holy war against Muslims that has since come to be known as the First Crusade. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Um, I won't go any further than, than that. That's the primary charge against him is this, uh, this First Crusade. Um, uh, I'm be very interested in your reactions to that, but I, I'll tell you first that uh, uh, what the, we see the Muslims have done historically, trying to impose their religion on the world, and even today they're still trying to impose it by force. <clears throat> and and uh, I know the brother Sam, he doesn't ever threaten to cut off someone's head if they don't uh, convert to Christianity. Uh, and uh, we, what we do is we tell them the good news and we answer their questions and we will try to persuade them, but we're not going to impose it through force. But that's what Islam has done. The word Islam literally means submit. And so uh, Islam means that everybody must submit to that, to Allah as the only true God, and uh, um, or you eat or die. And But we see that the Roman... Catholic religion, this Pope, he went on a crusade and do, to do the, basically the same kind of a thing, uh, fight against these Muslims and, and force them to kill them. Uh, so uh, I see that the history of Romanism has the same kind of a 
situation as uh, Islam in that they don't want, they're not trying to convert people through the, persuading them through the scriptures. They do two things. They sprinkle them at birth and when they have no idea what what is going on, they, they're not making any kind of mental ascent of understanding the gospel and believing. So they become a, a Roman Catholic at birth uh, and then if they vary and, and, and ever get away from any of their basic tenets, then they will by force torture and kill them and take their property. So what's the difference? between this Pope and Romanism and what we've seen in Islam. I'll start with Brother Bill. Well, yeah, both, both in essence, you know, want conversion by force and by pain and by fear. So in that sense, you know, both the Papal Crusades and Islam are very similar. You know, we, and we know the truth is that, that Christ desires salvation in love. And in peace, you know that that that's my my position on that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's unfortunate that uh, you know we see all these movies being made and an artwork and and the these crusaders they all have their shields with a cross on it, uh, but they they never believed in the cross. They believed in the Romanism and the Pope, and their faith was not in the cross and. Uh, so here the world sees what they believe is Christianity going off to war and killing everybody. Brother Jackson, how does that help uh, in terms of someone that is not a believer? Does that hurt, hurt them, uh, their ability to accept Christianity when they think that's what it is? Um, unfortunately for a lot of people it does, Luke. It really does. Because I've talked to many people and they always say, well, what about all the harm that Christianity has done? And I'll be like, what are you talking about? And they'll bring up all these things that the Roman Catholic Church has done. And I have to explain to them that I'm as far from Roman Catholicism, if not further, than they are. All right, Brother Sam, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, um, you know... Crusades, for example, it, that's one of the things how, uh, in a political means or even religious means, uh, use just kind of innocent uh, people in a way, and uh, uh, to the point that they can raise an army and just kind of slaughter people. Uh, so to say, um, I don't know. It's uh, it's almost like uh, I think it went on for about like two hundred, almost two hundred years since the uh, eleventh century uh, crusades, for example. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> I might be far fetching, but you know, because of that, you know, maybe that's one of the reason why. Black Death came about uh, in about what 14th century. Uh, whenever we do stuff like that, we get spanked from 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 God. You know what? I mean, <laughs> first of all, we are we are to love each other. We are not to you know cut off <laughs> someone's head off. You know, it, it, somehow. I don't know where that has been gone wrong, but somehow it seems like uh, people have some kind of pride issue as well. Um, it's, it's, it's little things can rise to bigger things, and just like little fights can arise to wars and holy wars and and so on. Uh, but I think that's bottom line in, in this sort of uh, case I think it's the pride uh, and from that on a lot of people resulted in death uh, which wasn't even Christian at all uh, to the point that you know I, that's my this is my assumption but to the point that there will be uh, some sort of rage from, from God such as like that 
you know. And if people want, you know, killing each other, going places to different places or different Asias or whatever, you know, that sort of disease probably won't uh, spread. But um, uh, sometimes we mean well. And even for me, I sometimes say, you know, mean things to other people, uh, but you know, not not to the point that you would uh, actually, you know, do some physical harm upon other people. Uh, just the fact that you know you are killing someone in the name of God. Uh, <laughs> That <laughs> that's kind of oxymoron for me, uh, as far as you know the teachings of Christ is concerned. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I've I've found that uh, it, it is one of the common objections of of an unbeliever uh, when you all four of us are evangelists. We every opportunity we get, we want to tell people the good news about Jesus and this free gift of salvation. And as we go about doing this, one of the things that comes up all the time is this idea of the Crusades. Look what look what they look about the Crusades. So it's something that is uh, uh, it's a black eye on Christianity in in the world's view. Whereas we know that that was not Christianity at all, because the real Christians weren't going at war to force people to become Christians. They were being thrown to the lions and and singing hymns as they were persecuted. And I'll ask Brother Bill to make the final word on this, and then I'll move on. Yeah, I just want to concur what you just said. You know, historically, the, the, the true sons of God, you know, were the ones that that were persecuted at the front of the lions. You know, horrendously treated by the Roman Church, and, and, and at that, you know, at their heart, you know, they sincerely wanted the people to, you know, to go to heaven. They wanted to give the true gospel out, and they just show that, that that Christ is enough. That is the real true Christians, the persecuted ones, and 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 I agree. You know, true sons of God need to be separate from from Roman Catholicism because we're not the same. You know, one is a cult, and one and one one is true. Science. Amen. All right, uh, I'll move on. Unless Jackson has any final thing to say, I'll move on. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, let me see. Okay, I guess I'm still there, but. I Lost my uh, page for uh, my notes. Okay, it's coming back now. I had to reload. Referencing a page, I found that the, the, the ten worst popes in history. Yeah, but um, uh, and this is one person's opinion. So. Uh, Everybody is free to do their own research uh, and on all the popes, and you'll find that this kind of behavior was quite common throughout uh, the history of uh, uh, popes. Uh, his uh, uh, the date on him is 1487 to 1555. Born to a famous Roman jurist, Giovanni Maria Chiocci del Monte was elected pope in Fimbrius III, while his early career in the church shows that he was a very capable and, su and successful, his papacy is known for being extremely ineffective and undistinguished. For the most part, Julius withdrew to his palace and spent the majority of his time seeing to his own personal pleasures and keeping out of political affairs. <laughs> okay. So uh, he sounds like uh, one of our presidents in the past that was uh, and took the same attitude. Uh, I think it was Coolidge uh, that, that basically just didn't want to do anything. Uh, he wasn't indulging his pleasures, but he was just thinking, "There's everything's so good. Why make any changes? Why do anything?" And this pope 
I guess the accusation against him is that he didn't even carry out his popish duties. He just uh, indulged his, his physical pleasures. Another example, uh, Jackson. Hey, Lou. Okay. Um, Bill? I think I, ha I have to go now, unfortunately. Something oh. came up. But um, okay. thank you for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll be on later or whatever. So. Okay. All right, brother. Thanks, thanks for participating. We'll okay. talk to you later. All right. Bye. Okay. Brother Bill? Well, yeah, that's just, <laughs> just typical, wasn't it? You know, when things are good, he just carry on indulging himself. You know, it's just, you know, it sums up, you know. You're, you're muted there, Luke. Thank you, brother. I forgot about that that time. I've been pretty good using this mute button, but uh, uh, so this pope basically, uh, uh, it doesn't elaborate on what his pursuing his worldly pleasures or physical pleasures was, but I guess we'll have to use our imagination there. Um, now let's move on to the... Uh, now here's a. Uh, all right. Then we got uh, Pope Stephen the sixth, the the eleventh. For uh, doesn't have a begin a birth date, but uh, his his he I guess he died in eight eight ninety seven, and little is known about Pope Stephen the sixth's personal life and background. Although he was a Roman and the son of a priest named John. The reason his name stands out in church history is because of his involvement in what is perhaps the most bizarre ecclesiastical trial of all time, the Cadaver Synod of January 897. As the name reveals, this grotesque synod was convened to put a corpse on trial. Stephen ordered it for the sole purpose of passing judgment on the freshly exhumed body of Formosus, who had held the papacy in 891 to 96. Due to activities in Bulgaria which compromised his duty as Bishop of Porto, Formosus had been ex excommunicated by then Pope John uh, the Eighth. But after John the Eighth's death, he had reassumed his bishopric in Oporto and was elected Pope in 891. Um, let's just—I uh, won't go any further than that. But uh, the idea of this kind of politics. And, and even uh, exhuming a body and putting it on trial, I mean, what kind of an extreme behavior uh, is, is that? Uh, Sam, you, do you think there's anything in, in the true church history where, you know, biblical Christians exhumed someone's body and put them on trial? <laughs> That's like uh, beyond belief, isn't it? Um, I, I'm just speechless. Uh, I don't know. I mean, these are the same people who, I guess, believe the Earth was flat. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the the uh, the politics of it is something that a lot of people have not uh, been aware of, and it it was really dirty, hardcore politics that, that, that it seemed like they were, would be willing to do anything to win uh, the position of Pope and then go after other Popes the, the, of the past, even even dead Popes they would go after if they had a grudge against them. <laughs> Brother Bill? Well, yeah, like I said, it, that was even the similar sort of scenario happened as we spoke on a few weeks ago, where, where they exhumed William Tyndale, you know, in the 16th century. You know, I mean, we 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 spoke on this a few weeks ago. They even burnt him and cast his ashes into the river, you know, assuming that that because he was cremated that he, he wouldn't enter into glory. You know, that, that's the same thing. You know, exactly the same mentality. You know, only you know different pope. I think that was Pope Gregory the Eleventh. It seems to think of it, Pope Gregory's for sure.
yeah, it's uh, it's some of the some of these things are so shocking. It, it it's really you're almost speechless. Like like Sam, what do you say about something like that? That there's a that they would go to such lengths just for revenge of a of a dead pope. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Uh, pope Benedict the ninth, ten twelve to ten eighty five. Benedict the the ninth, born Theophylactus of Tusculum, is known mainly for two things. He held office on three separate occasions, and he is the only pope who ever sold the papacy to his own godfather of all people. <laughs> oh man, that's a. Uh, I mean, there's more to be said, but uh, I, I don't want to read any more about it. It's just that alone is that uh, uh, he held the position of pope on three separate occasions. I mean, I, I thought that popes are supposed to be pope for life, but uh, that that just shows you about the politics that's involved. You know, uh, somehow he lost his pope position and regained it three times, and then he sold the position of pope. To his own godfather. So, uh, <laughs> Brother Sam, are you still speechless, or? <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> so that's on mute. <laughs> it's laughable. <laughs> is, is it? Is it like a liquor license or something? You got you got to sell your pope shit. I mean, oh boy. Uh, yeah, again, it's speechless. I mean, uh, either people. Or that the dumb, or just the the Pope? These guys were just oblivious to people. What people were uh, thinking, or 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 having made. I mean, no wonder that that there had been uprising and all this against Catholic and Protestant, and uh, you know, starting from what? Uh, ah, boy. Uh, it's, uh, I it's think just... that uh, <laughs> I think some of the lay people, uh, and even maybe the lower level clergy, uh, you know, actually spoke against and and uh, did and disagreed with these kind kinds of behavior that we've been discussing from the popes. Uh, but you did it at at uh, in your own peril because you know if if you if you spoke against it, uh, then you know who knows they're going to. Torture you and kill you and take your property. So, uh, Brother Bill, uh, were you aware that this pope actually sold his pope position? No, no, I'm not. This is this was news to me. This one, it's quite amusing. You know, it, it just shows you the depravity there of it all. You know, the, the, this person, you know, by apostolic succession, is supposed to be, you know, the apostle Peter. Would sell it and buy it back again, sell it, buy it back, and sell it. You know, it's just absolutely ludicrous, and it just shows you what is at the heart of, of, of the Roman Church and still is, and that is money, wealth, and indulgence. Yeah. Okay, we're almost through with this list here. Uh, Pope John the Seventh, I know the twelfth, nine thirty-seven to nine sixty-four. Born in Rome, the young Octavianus practically had the papacy handed to him on a silver platter. His father, a patrician of Rome, made the Roman noble swear an oath that at the next vacancy in the papal seat, Octavianus would be elected. Sure enough, when he was only 18, the reigning pope passed away, and Octavianus was chosen as the successor, taking the name Pope John the the Twelfth. Um, almost everything known about John the, the Twelfth is uh, is uh, is found in the writings of his enemies. So it's possible that the accounts we have are factually distorted. Nevertheless, the stories we do have are quite shocking. He was accused of committing many adulteries, even with his own niece, turning the Vatican into a whorehouse, blinding his confessor. Uh, castrating and then murdering a subdeacon, invoking demons and foreign gods, the list goes on and on. Even if some of the reports were falsified, it still appears that John the Twelfth 
made for a pretty bad pope. When we read the account of John's death that claims he was murdered by a jealous husband whose wife was the object of the Pope's special attention, it's not too hard to believe it. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, and it, it's so appalling. <laughs> but uh, again, I, I just want to emphasize to the audience that the reason we're, do, we're, we're doing this is because <clears throat> part, of the Ro part of the Roman Catholic religion is uh, the belief that this Pope is the Vicar of Christ and that he is the infallible uh, and, and uh, he's, he's basically, if not worshipped, nearly worshipped by the, the, the Roman Catholic uh, 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 lay people. And it, are, are, have these people historically been worthy of this kind of uh, uh, adulation? It's, it's, it's shameful. This one is particularly is very shameful. Brother Sam? Yes. <laughs> you know, I, you know that's, that's one of the things uh, uh, when I'm, that's why I don't really don't want to talk about Catholic, but we, we must because people don't know about this sort of things. Um, I'd rather talk about happy things. <laughs> but, but, you know, one thing that we can put our measure to, all their heresies and all their evil doings and strange, awkward <laughs> things, even to the, you know, kind of, kind of macromantic, kind of death mask, kind of that sort of dark, <laughs> gothic. Besides all that, you know, people simply can just read through the scripture. And if they can even have, uh, have time, you know, compare that, compare that system, Roman Catholic, and the things that they have done uh, to Christ, you know, simply. So... When we compare that sort of behavior and actions to what Christ said and done for us, obviously, you know, if Christ were living, he, if Christ were to be the Pope, yeah, I don't think I don't think he'll be doing that, right? So, uh, I think uh, I think we can uh, safely guard ourselves. Um, putting by putting Christ as our standard. Yeah, the uh, you know the behavior of, of someone is not how I judge someone's salvation. Uh, a lot of people that we we the three of us, are, we spend a lot of time arguing with those people who are teaching lordship salvation and their fruit inspectors and try to analyze people's lives, put them under a microscope and, and, and determine if they're truly a Christian based upon how much their life has changed, if they have any sin in their life. And uh, the, even though some of this behavior of these popes is really extreme, um, what uh, is really the problem is their doctrine. We're going to go into that after we talk about one one more pope, I think. But uh, uh, the behavior is shocking, and it should tell the Roman Catholics that uh, why do you put your faith in this religion and these the pope, the popes? Because I think their faith is just as much in the pope as it is in the religion itself. Uh, when you when you understand that. Uh, they, they've been so corrupt throughout history and, and as, as we go on forward we're going to discuss the false beliefs of, of Romanism. Uh, Brother Bill, what about this Pope before we go on? Okay. I guess he's uh, stepped away. Let me. Uh... Hello, hello. Did you call on me? Did you? Uh, yes, I did. Did. Yeah, so I got a bit of a delay there. I'm okay now. Okay. It was, uh, it was freezing up on me. 
All right, this this pope uh, it seems to be uh, like one of the worst examples we've been discussing. Everything he did. Uh, comment on him. We'll go on. I think I got one more pope, and then we're going to move into the the uh, false doctrines of Rome. Yeah, yeah. I'd only like to just comment, I suppose, briefly to say that it's not so much that the, the abhorrent sins that, that that these popes commit. You know, because there, there there are honestly true born again sons of God that have done the most wicked things. But it's the fact that 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 they try or they proclaim to adhere to you know you've got to be saved by by living good and by behaviour. Yet they're the worst of them all. Yet you know we as true sons of God proclaim that you know we're not saved by behaviour but by Christ alone. Yet we seem to manifest godliness. So it's it's the hypocrisy of that that their work salvation and they do completely co contrary to what they preach. It's hypocrisy. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, really a very good point. That uh, uh, we are biblical Christians, and Christianity, as we learn it from the Bible, tells us that our our status as Christians is not based upon our behavior, it's based upon our faith in Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. Um, and, and then we, we, we tend to have, uh, even though we're not perfect, uh, most uh, biblical Christians I've encountered, uh, I have seen a lot of uh, good character and changes in their lives, nothing like these popes, and yet the, in Romanism, they take the opposite viewpoint that no salvation is not by faith alone. It's based upon your performance. And then look at the performance of the popes, the leaders, who are supposed to be the very best of all, and it's atrocious. Uh, Brother Sam, I'm going to go to the next pope, the worst pope of all on this list, uh, unless you want to comment on what we just said. No, no, that's good. good. Let's go for the worst. Okay. Okay, the reward for baddest pope ever arguably goes to Rodrigo Borgia, who enjoyed the benefits of having an uncle who just happened to be Pope Calixtus III. Thanks to his convenient social status, Borgia passed through the ranks of bishop, cardinal, and vice-chancellor, gaining enormous wealth along the way. In 1492, he was actually able to buy his way into the papacy, defeating two other opponents by means of bribery. Alexander was so corrupt that his surname eventually became a byword representing the hellishly low papal standards of the time. He sired at least seven different illegitimate children by his mistresses and didn't hesitate to reward them with handsome endowments at the church's expense. When low on finances, he either established new cardinals in return for payments, or he slammed wealthy people with completely fabricated charges, jailed or murdered them for said false charges, and then stole their money. Not surprisingly, there's very little about Alexander VI that can be considered godly or even lawful. His goal is selfish and ambitious, and the orderly government he initially as administered quickly deteriorated until the city of Rome was in a state of complete disrepair. The words spoken by Giovanni de' Medici, the future Pope Leo X, after Borgia's election are telling, quote, Now we are in the power of a wolf, the most rapacious, perhaps, that ha this world has ever seen, will devour us all, unquote. Um, I uh, I haven't seen the the whole series, but on uh, on uh, Netflix they have a series about this Pope Borgia and his family, and I watched some of the episodes, and it, yeah, it's right. It's it goes right along along with this here, and it really is appalling. But uh, I couldn't bring myself to continue watching it. It was it was. Not, is your sound breaking up? 
Are we stuck? Hello? There's problems with that. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? What, what do you think? think? Hello? Luke, Luke you can put your back up. Hello? Luke, Luke, you've lost your camera. Well, you're back. See, you I said camera. about the, that. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Sam, but I think Luke has completely broken up. I, can, I can hear you. Okay. We've got, we've got some real delay issues here, Luke, because we, all we can see is a frozen picture, no sound. I think there is some kind of network issue right now. Yeah, it must be. It must be. Hello? Uh, yeah, I'm Are still here. I'm still here. I'm still here, but Luke, Luke is frozen. Yeah. Maybe maybe Luke is having a network issue. Yeah, I think I think it's Luke's yeah. end. He was talking and all of a sudden he was frozen and I'm like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> yeah. Maybe they got maybe got maybe they got some uh, Jesuits working for for Google. <laughs> or or, or uh, maybe they infiltrated the uh, the internet provider. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you can hear. I don't know if you can hear us, brother Rick. But uh, if you are having a network issue, you might want to uh, refresh and then come back. As long as you come back in five minutes. Uh, you know, we should be still live. If he logs off, will it not disconnect us then completely? No, we'll be we'll be alive for five minutes, and within five minutes, if he comes back, it'll, it'll continue. All right. But, uh, you, yeah. I don't know if you can hear us though. I I, I cannot hear him at all. No, no, can I? Have you heard that, Luke? Have you heard what 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 Brother Sam just said? Hear you? Can, I can hear you. Uh, I don't know how to refresh though. Oh, now now I can hear you a little bit, but uh, but the but the screen is still the uh, you know frozen. I'm not sure how to refresh. Uh, my picture's frozen. I can hear you guys talking, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. Well, did you hear what I read about this Pope Borgia? Half of it. Okay. Yeah, just, just um, a little bit, I guess. Not all of it. Okay. Uh, if you can hear me now, I'm going to read it again briefly, and then you'll. Uh, then I ask you guys just to respond to that. Okay. Um, okay. Everything is moving very slowly on my computer right now, so. I, I click on something and it's, I don't know why it seems to be overloaded. You, you talk about, uh, you know, him having wives and uh, and uh, having, you know, killing people and taxing the riches when he doesn't have money and things like that. So, and that's, as, that's how much I heard so far. Okay. All right. Well, that's the gist of it. You know, he, he, there was no limit to the evil that he would do. Uh, he had all these children. Uh, Hello? We've lost your sound as well now, Luke. <laughs> I think Jesuits are really working hard. You know, yeah, they don't, they don't, <laughs> whatever that part is, Brother Bill. Yeah, I reckon <laughs> his holy Jan has got in and he's infiltrated it. <laughs> it's very deep here. <laughs> Information is so anyway, brother Luke, the same spot we cannot hear. Oops, right. what's that? Yeah, he's gone, so hopefully he'll come back in and we'll still be here. He's got five minutes, has he? Okay. Well I have some problem too. I think I have to come back as well. He says on my cell. Unfortunately, Hangouts has stopped. Oh, I'm still in. Uh, it's still going. So, yeah, obviously I have some problem. 
So Google, if you are hearing, uh, yeah, you know, what do you, what are you doing with your billions of dollars anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be right, I'll be right back. Hopefully. All right, mate. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just me and Google against the world here. So, beans, I've got my open space. You know, come on, Google, sort it out. The gospel needs to go out. You know, there's people in the Roman Church that need saving. You know, and we have got our modern popes as well today in the Protestant Church as well. I might as well say it, beans, it's just me. We've got our Benny Hins and Morris Sorellos and Kenneth Copelands. That these are modern day popes that, that corrupt Christendom. You know, if you want to find the true faith. You know, keep away from these 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 wicked people, these wolves. They just come to Christ in a simplicity. It's just by faith alone, just believing on Christ that He died for your sins, that He was buried, and He rose again. And if you used to believe on them simple facts, and in whom they are wrought, which is Jesus Christ, Son of God, you can be saved. You need no pope. You need no indulgence. You need nothing. You just need Christ alone. But there you go. So I might as well thought I'd get that little bit out. Well, it's just me. Can you hear me, Sam? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Just there is a lot. I'm going to give it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Google is really playing up because it's took about five minutes for me the effects to come up. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to make some kind of what what you reckon? Well, like what happened to Brother Luke? Is he back yet? No, he's still not back. He needs to hurry up, though, because in the meantime, I'm going to have to play some drums. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I hope he does come back. <laughs> Boys, we're stuck there alone. Just me and you against the world. And the Jesuits. <laughs> and the time is ticking. In a couple of minutes, it will be over. Exactly. Come well, on, come on. Don't uh, let well, you know, like, like you, we can talk about it, like, you know, whatever he talked about. So, uh, how far did you hear about the Pope? Well, I, all I, I heard, all I heard was he, he liked his.